So uh, an important point of uh, CBW is that all these materials uh, are openly accessible and openly reusable under the Creative Commons license. And I know Nia just uh, just shared this slide as well, and I think touched on it yesterday. Um, but uh, that also includes, you know, the, the us, the instructors. We we re reuse materials from from other lectures as well. And this slide deck that I'm going to present uh, includes quite a lot of material from my. Uh, close friend and collaborator, John Tyson, out of the BC Center for Disease Control. Uh, John was really one of the main contributors to the development of primer schemes and uh, sequencing methodology for, for SARS-CoV-2. We're going to be focused a lot on coronavirus today. Um, so it's so a big credit to John for not only uh, producing the slides, some of the slides I'm going to present today, but uh, also his huge you know, contribution to just uh, our ability to very cheaply and rapidly sequence coronavirus. All right, so uh, maybe I'll start in with the, the module. So this is module four. Welcome everybody, uh, viral pathogen genomic analysis. Um, so I'm Jared Simpson. I'm based at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, which is one of the hosts of CBW. Um, and my research group is focused on developing new bioinformatics methods for analyzing sequencing data. So originally, you know, 10, 12 years ago, when I got into bioinformatics, I was really focused on short read genome assembly. Uh, but over time, I'd say my uh, research aims have broadened to all things sequencing and how we can best reconstruct genomes uh, from raw sequencing data. So while my group mainly focuses on cancer genomics, so that's one of the main CBW modules that I teach, uh, sort of CBW courses that I teach, uh, there's a lot of transfer of bioinformatics methodology across different sequencing domains. So early on in the COVID pandemic, uh, I got involved with the Canadian National Project uh, to sequence coronavirus, which will uh, introduced yesterday, which is called CANCOGEN, and some of the nanopore analysis tools that we developed for, uh, you know, just calling variants against genomes, which were applied to Ebola and Zika and some other pathogens, became applicable to coronavirus as well. So I got involved in the project that way. Um, and then, you know, when we were putting together this workshop, uh, I offered to teach this module on how we interpret sequencing data uh, from viruses. So this is going to be very specific to coronavirus and particularly the way that we sequence coronavirus, which was using amplicon based schemes where we take tiled PCR across the genome, um, amplify those segments of the genome, and then try to reconstruct what the sequence of the virus was from those tiled segments. I'm going to get, get into all of that uh, as, as we go throughout this lecture. But uh, just to say that this lecture is very focused on viruses and particularly amplicon-based analysis. Uh, now, one thing I want to say is please feel free to ask questions uh, as much as possible. Um, I love asking questions. We're all here to learn. Um, so please feel free to put up your hand or even unmute yourself. Uh, and just interrupt me to ask a question as we go. I probably don't have a full hour lecture here, so we should have plenty of time um, before 11 a.m. here in Toronto to, uh, to answer questions. I know uh, just looking at Slack and watching the lectures yesterday that you've all had great questions, so uh, please do keep that going. Okay, so let's start off with the learning objectives. Um, so I'm gonna start with these slides from John where, uh, we're going to talk about the different approaches to sequencing pathogens, but more specifically viral genomes. And this is really going to try to address the question of how we can take a clinical sample, which may have very, very little viral material, and uh, amplify or enrich that uh, uh, up to a sufficient level that we can then sequence the entire genome and reconstruct it. And, uh, you know, a bit of a spoiler here, the, the way that we're going to be talking about is amplicon-based sequencing data. Um, but amplicon data, well, it's a great way of, uh, you know, recovering full-length viral genomes. Uh, it's very challenging to analyze. It's more challenging than just whole genome shotgun sequencing. So I'm going to highlight some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges of analyzing amplicons. Uh, and then in the, mostly in the module that we're going to be, uh, the hands-on part of the module later on, we'll be interpreting the results of amplicon-based analysis pipelines. We'll be taking real uh, SARS-CoV-2 data 
uh, running it through a, a genome reconstruction pipeline called Signal, and then uh, interpreting the results and performing quality control uh, on that data. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, pathogen genetic testing and typing. Um, so there's a lot of different molecular tests you can do for pathogens, uh, but they all sort of follow a similar workflow. You might take your sample, which could be you know anything from cultured isolates all the way up to just swabs or blood samples from uh, you know, the infected patient. Uh, but the first step is always going to be going to be doing a nucleic acid extraction from that uh, sample. Uh, so some pathogens, of course, are DNA. Other pathogens are RNA. Uh, and if it's RNA, your next step would be converting uh, the RNA to cDNA uh, through just reverse transcription. And then we've got a couple of different workflows that we can use to identify whether there was a specific pathogen in that sample. So if you know the pathogen that you're looking for, you might go to qPCR where you have uh, you know, short primers and probes for particular highly conserved regions of the pathogen's genome, and essentially just looking for the presence or absence of those probes uh, in your sample. Or you can start to do uh, some targeted sequencing. So if you maybe don't know what pathogen is in the sample, you can sequence a 16S. So just do targeted sequencing of the ribosomal 16S, then try to match it to some database of 16S sequences. Or you could go all the way through to whole genome shotgun sequencing. Uh, this is more widely used when you need, say, SNPs to look for uh, cluster cases and outbreaks. So looking for mobile elements like plasmids. Um, and there's a lot of different ways we can uh, do whole genome sequencing, either completely unbiased, like metagenomics, or with highly targeted amplicon schemes, like we've done for Ebola, Zika, uh, and, and of course, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so let's talk about sequencing in a little bit more detail. Um, so the easiest way, and by far the most straightforward from the analysis uh, point of view is just sequencing isolates. So here we've managed to isolate the pathogen or the genome of interest, usually through doing something like culturing a bacteria, and then just sequencing and assembling the genome or aligning it to some reference database to identify uh, what was there. Slightly more uh, work up front in, in uh, sort of in the wet lab uh, and a little bit more in the analysis is targeted sequencing. Where we might not want to sequence the entire genome, but just sequence a little bit of the genome. Here, we usually just copy out the stretch that we're interested in using PCR primers, again, to highly conserved region, then sequence it and identify it uh, by you know, matching your 16S reads to, uh, to some pathogen database you're using any of the workflows that are available for 16S analysis. Uh, the big caveat here is that unlike if you're just sequencing an isolate, uh, you need some prior knowledge of what the target is so that you can design your PCR primers to amplify that uh, region of interest. Or you have the most complicated case uh, where we're doing essentially just metagenomics uh, where your pathogen of interest is a component of the total uh, amount of DNA or RNA within that sample. Um, and you need to detect that pathogen sequence in the sea of other sequence that you may have uh, determined from your sequencing run. And again, you can do this either one of two ways. You can either do pure shock on sequencing where you don't try to enrich anything. You just sequence the total complement of DNA or RNA within that sample then do your analysis on that. Or you can try to capture your pathogens or targets of interest, um, or even deplete background material like say human RNA or DNA that you're not interested in uh, and preferentially sequence uh, the material that you've enriched. Uh, now this, the choice of strategy, whether you're gonna do shotgun, probe enrichment, amplicons, really just depends on two factors. The first factor is just your target abundance. So in real clinical samples, taking in coronavirus, for example, um, you don't necessarily recover a lot of viral RNA. Uh, sometimes you can have uh, 
you know, tiny, tiny amounts of viral RNA, where if you just do, say, metagenomics of all the RNA from your nasal pharyngeal swab, you won't recover enough sequencing reads to detect whether SARS-CoV-2 is there. So that would be a case where we have very, very little target abundance. Now, conversely, if we have very, very high target abundance where there's tons of material there, you know, there is a very active, say, infection of, of coronavirus, um, you may be able to just do shotgun metagenomics and uh, recover enough uh, sequence to reconstruct that viral genome. So this is sort of the most important access for determining whether you want to do enrichment of your sample or not. So if you have low abundance of your pathogen, you probably want to enrich. If you have high abundance, uh, you probably don't need to uh, enrich. Now, when you're going to, going to do some enrichment, you really have two routes, two different strategies. You can either do amplicons, you know, tiled PCR primers across the entire genome, or you can do probe capture where you uh, take short oligonucleotides uh, that bind to the genome of interest, uh, and then you have them attached to things like biotin that you can enrich um, and uh, to, to just enrich for that pathogen sequence. Um, and the choice of the, between amplicons or probe capture really depends on the diversity in the genome. If there's very low diversity, if there's not a lot of SNPs, um, amplicons are probably a better choice. But if there's a very high diversity where your, those SNPs might uh, interrupt your PCR primer binding sites, uh, you may want to go to probe capture. And all these different strategies between shotgun sequencing, amplicons, and probe capture have different trade-offs for how expensive they are and how easy the protocols are, with shotgun sequencing being uh, the cheapest and fastest, probe capture being the most expensive and the protocol taking the longest, uh, and amplicons uh, being somewhere in the middle where the cost is sort of uh, medium and the protocol doesn't take uh, too long. Now we can take different pathogens and put them on this map of different sequencing strategies um, and see what this, the best strategy may be for a particular pathogen. So SARS-CoV-2, where again, we can have very, very low abundance, you know, when, when maybe it was a weak positive uh, from qPCR, um, but it's fairly low diversity. Uh, genome, especially with all these selective sweeps with, uh, you know, constant variants of concern arising. Uh, so we put it down in this bottom left corner here where amplicons are good strategy. Other genomes like flu, where there's a lot of circulating variation, don't work very well with amplicon schemes because you get a lot of dropouts. We'll talk about dropouts a little bit later on. Uh, so you may want to do uh, probe capture. And up here, again, where you have, like, say, cultured bacterial isolates, there you don't need to worry about doing any sort of target enrichment through amplicons or probe capture. You just uh, directly sequence the cultures with, uh, uh, with shotgun sequencing. Okay, uh, any questions there about design of sequencing strategies before I move on a little bit into the analysis? Yeah, uh, Tess, do you wanna go ahead? I saw your hand go first, so I'll give you a first shot. Yeah, for sure. I was just wondering in terms of RNA viruses, what priming techniques are most common for reverse transcription that you see within the public health sector? Yeah, uh, I'm sure somebody else on this the, the call can answer this more definitively than I can, but I'm pretty sure uh, the dominant ways, at least for coronavirus, uh, was just random hexamer reverse transcription. Anybody, anybody have a, a different opinion or you know better understanding? Sounds not. Uh, Deborah, do you wanna do you wanna ask your question? Did you say Deborah? Hi, Deborah. Okay, so uh, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, cultured isolate. Is there a particular or special way to culture when you want to do uh, this type of analysis or uh, the normal culturing method is, is fine? So what, what type of culturing method do you use when you want to do this type of analysis? 
And also my second question is about extraction. Is there a particular kit that you recommend for extraction of uh, uh, RNA or DNA samples from viruses? Yeah, so uh, I'll answer the, the culture question first. Um, so essentially like any, any culture, you know, method, any, any method that you use that you can culture your bacteria in would be sufficient for sequencing. Um, the culture obviously takes a clone and expands it up to many, 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 many copies uh, where there's going to be enough DNA after you cultured it that you can do an extraction and then sequence. So I don't think there's a particular culturing method I can recommend that's appropriate for whole genome sequencing work. As long as you can culture it, you should be able to extract DNA and then uh, and then off you go. For the second question about extraction techniques, it is it is quite important um, for uh, for clinical work. We saw a lot of variation in your ability to recover complete genomes from sequencing coronavirus, depending on the extraction kit that you use. I can't offhand remember or recommend a particular extraction kit, but you know if you're starting a new project where you're going to be sequencing a large number of pathogens, it's well worth testing out different extraction kits and seeing how well they recover uh, viral material uh, and how well that sequences and whether you can recover the entire genome. So that, that's definitely important, but I can't make, uh, I can't make a definitive recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for your question. Shamsuddin, do you want to ask your question now? Yes, um, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I saw in this image that you, uh, that the slide that we're on now, I can see hepatitis C virus on one side, that is amplicons, and then I can see unknowns uh, hepatitis C virus. I just wanted to know what's the difference. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. It's something I didn't, uh, I didn't highlight here. So hepatitis C, has incredible diversity, both you know, within the different uh, circulating lineages, but also within individual hosts. There's a lot of quasi-species, which, which makes it perform very, very poorly if you want to use an amplicon-based sequencing method. So it pushes it out to these other methods where we need to do slightly less biased sequencing. Um, but what's the, why it's listed down here is that there are highly conserved regions in hepatitis C where there's not a lot of variation, and you can design primers to amplify those highly conserved regions and sequence them. So it's sort of a special, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's for certain regions of the genome are amenable to uh, doing these more targeted approaches, but in general, you need to use fairly unbiased approaches for hep C. I hope I answered that question. Yes, you have. Thank you. Uh, Ian, do you have a question? Um, I just wanted to kind of give uh, some feedback about the, the priming for the RT step. Um, mm -hmm. The original um, Amplicon protocols for, <clears throat> for Arctic Amplicons, uh, they all use like a two-step reaction, which is an RT and it's random hexamers and oligo DTs mixed. Mm -hmm. um, but we have switched to a one-step PCR amplification. Um, and so that RT step uses uh, target specific primers for the RT. Great, fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, if I could just ask a quick question about the yeah, random course. prime and strand switch um, method. Uh, could you just elaborate on that? I, have, I haven't actually looked into that. Um, that, yeah, uh, I probably have to go back and look or ask John, uh, okay. this, is, this is a slide from him, but I think that's more or less just, you know, meta, his, his stand in for like a metagenomics protocol where you just, if you're sequencing metagenomics from RNA, uh, random prime to cDNA, but I'm not sure about the strategy. Okay. So I'll check and then get back to you on that. Okay, thanks very much. No problem. Uh, have you? Yes, hello. Um, so what type of samples would be uh, difficult to um, extract DNA from in a, in a quality enough to do like a really good uh, sequencing? Like it, it, like it is I hard to the obtain. Second, the, the second half part of your question. You, I heard what part, what type of samples would be difficult, but then I, I missed the rest, sorry. 
no, sorry. Um, so in, in terms of sequencing, which, which types of sample can be harder to obtain good DNA quality in order to get a good sequencing, a high quality sequencing? So I think it's, it's, it's less dependent on the type of sample than the abundance of the sample. So if you have something that's in very, very high abundance, um, you typically can extract DNA and they get, get a good quality gene all out. There are definitely different bacteria that it's harder to extract DNA from, or they have really high AT or GC content where the analysis and you know, the sequencing becomes more tricky. But I would say at least for the, this sort of, uh, this topic where we were talking about, you know, sequencing viral genomes from clinical samples, it's more uh, the abundance of the target that's, uh, that's important. I hope that answered your question. And I'll take one more question and then we probably should move in, uh, move on. So, uh, uh, Goltikin, sorry if I didn't see your name right. Could you? Uh... That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a quick questions about that depletion step, which is, I mean, uh, I saw a lot of uh, wet lab procedure is available for human or host depletion. But uh, let's imagine that we couldn't do that depletion step and we did the sequencing and like 90 or 95% of the sequences are uh, hitting with the human genome, let's say. And yeah. like after extracting that bioinformatically, can we still say that this is reliable? I mean, these results, if, for example, if we found a virus or like, um, how can I say, uh, about if we find something like a bacteria and or virus, or can we say that these uh, results are reliable or can we go, do we need to go back and do the depletion, I mean, wet lab uh, depletion stuff? That's a very good question, and it's, it sets up nicely something I'm going to talk about later on, uh, which is quality control of sequencing results. So just because you've done some sequencing doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the results are reliable. Um, and, and this idea that you have a high amount of human or host background DNA is certainly a challenge that we faced with Cancogen, you know, our, our national project sequence SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the pipeline that we're going to be using in the practical session a little bit later on, the very first step of that pipeline is to map reads to both the human and coronavirus reference genome and throw out all the reads that map to the human genome so that they don't influence the analysis of, of, of the viral genome. Um, so it's this, this, this problem of high host contamination is something to handle on the informatics end. And then the second part of your question is, you know, whether we have a reliable genome construction is something I'm going to cover in depth uh, later on in this, in this lecture. So I'll, I'll defer that question a little bit, but it's certainly a very important one. All right, so let's carry on now. Great questions, everybody. I think that was a great discussion. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much because Will gave a very nice introduction to different sequencing technologies uh, yesterday. Um, but once you've extracted DNA and you know amplified it or did some probe capture to a rich for whatever pathogen you're interested in, we have a lot of different choices for our sequencing technology. And the one we're going to focus on today is our Lumina short read sequencer. Um, but I just want to put in a mention for the oxygen nanopore long read sequencers. Uh, as they were very, very widely used for, uh, for sequencing coronavirus during the pandemic because of the inherent portability of the midline and how cheap it is to get started. So a lot of countries um, ran their entire surveillance programs just based on Oxford nanopore midlines. Um, and in fact, I got into this field of pathogen sequencing by writing variant calling software for the midline as part of the Arctic uh, project. Um, and really most of my research focuses on oxygen nanopore long reads. So uh, it's slightly ironic that this entire lecture and practical is gonna be using Illumina short reads. Um, but what I hope to get across is the commonalities of how the analysis workflows, um, take your raw sequencing data uh, and turn it into a viral genome sequence. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing on tiled amplicon sequencing because we have this uh, you know, regime where the 
uh, targets the pathogens at very low abundance and is fairly low diversity, which makes it highly amenable to uh, amplifying with just PCR primers. Um, and we're going to be using data in the practical sec section uh, from the Arctic protocol. Um, I was part of the Arctic network when we were sequencing Ebola and Zika. Um, and it was very fortunate that they had a lot of tools developed for sequencing viral genomes, um, both from the wet lab side and bioinformatics side. Um, they had these tools available, you know, at the start of the pandemic, and they were very, very rapidly able to adapt them to uh, coronavirus. And the main workhorse protocol was really called Arctic V3. The, the Amplicon scheme went through various uh, revisions and versions through the pandemic, which uses 98 primer pairs uh, in two non-overlapping PCR uh, pools with 400 base pair amplicons. And a really big challenge uh, at the bench side, which is balancing the amplicons. So you don't want you know, all of your coverage from one primer pool to come from a single amplicon. You want these amplicons to be uh, relatively balancing the amount of material that they generate. So um, John and Josh Quick uh, and a lot of, you know, bench scientists spent a tremendous amount of time balancing concentrations of PCR primers to get relatively even coverage of the genome. But even then, you still need to sequence uh, quite deeply, uh, you know, up to a thousand X. I think the Sanger Institute was sequencing 10,000 X on the NovaSeq uh, to make sure that you have representation of every amplicon in your pool. And I see Jose mentioned in Slack here that um, now up to Arctic V5, that, that's, that, that, that's true. That's the newest uh, iteration of the protocol. Uh, and maybe this is a good time to mention the, re the, the reason that we need to keep updating different versions of the protocol is that as the dominant circulating lineages um, have SNPs scattered across the genome, if those SNPs are in PCR primer binding site, that amplicon will then drop out or it may drop out or amplify at lower efficiency. So there's this constant need to update the primer schemes as the dominant variant of coronavirus changes. So now that we're in you know, Omicron days, uh, they needed to change the PCR primers to uh, adapt to Omicron and have alternative primers um, so that you still recover nearly complete genomes instead of having primer dropouts. So thanks, Jose, for bringing that up. Okay, so let's talk about analysis pipelines. Um, so this is the general overview of a whole genome sequencing, whole genome shotgun sequencing pipeline. So we take fast Q files from our sequencer. Uh, we're then gonna align the reads to a reference genome using a program like BWAMM. Uh, we then call variants uh, with respect to the reference genome using programs like Freebase are many, many different variant callers. Freebase is one that I prefer and one that we use for coronavirus. And then we take the variant calls and we generate a consensus to sequence for the sample that we've sequenced uh, using a program like BCF tools, where we're gonna take the reference genome and the set of variants with respect to that reference genome. And then we're gonna just swap in the variants at every position of our reference to get our derived sequence for that sample. And that's gonna be output as a fast A uh, format sequence. And that is our genome uh, for the sample that we sequenced. Now I've intentionally simplified this pipeline. Um, there's a lot of quality control steps, a lot of things like trimming adapters, filtering variants that I'm not uh, going to talk about in uh, detail, uh, but these are really the three key steps that I want to uh, emphasize today. So let's talk about these steps uh, in detail, and if this is something that you're interested in, I'll put in a plug for the high throughput sequencing CPW workshop. Uh, that's the one that I lead, uh, and we talk about all these different steps in the analysis pipeline. Um, in considerable detail, where each one of these steps I'm going to talk about is really an individual module uh, on its own. So here I'm just going to give a high level overview of the different analysis steps. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions for any of this um, if you'd like to go into the topic in more detail. All right, so the first step is mapping reads and aligning them to our reference genome. So the problem here is that genomes are very big, but reads tend to be very, very small. Um, 
And this is even the case in coronavirus where the genome is only around 30,000 nucleotides in length, but our lumina reads are only about 100 to 200 bases. So we need to have programs that are going to take those short reads and determine where in the reference genome that read may have come from. And that problem is called the read mapping problem. So when we take a read and determine the most similar sequence on the reference to that read is what the mapping location uh, of that read. Then there's a subsequent step that takes the bases of the reference in that region and the bases of the read and lines them up base by base. And that's called the alignment step. So here, the alignment of this little read uh, to the reference looks like this, where we've drawn these uh, bars here to say the matching between bases of the read and bases of the reference. And there's one mismatch here where there's a T in the read and a C in the reference. This could be caused by a SNP or a simple sequencing error. And we're going to talk about how we can distinguish between those two cases uh, a little bit later. Uh, so you've probably heard of the SAM and BAM alignment format. Um, so SAM stands for Sequence Alignment and Mapping. So it stores both the mapping of the read and the alignment of the read. And BAM is just a binary version of SAM that uh, represents the same information, just in less space. So the key definitions here are the mapping, which is the region in the reference that is most similar to the read, and the alignment, which is how the read lines up to the reference base by base. Now, to determine a consensus sequence, what we're going to do is take all of the reads mapped to a certain position of the reference, like this T that I've highlighted in bold here, and we're going to look at the sequence that's present or the base that's present in every one of these reads. And we call this stack of bases that is aligned to a certain reference position a pylon. So variant callers and consensus callers examine all of the evidence in the reads at a reference position to determine what the position in the consensus sequence should be, what the base in the consensus sequence should be. Uh, so here, every read agrees that there is a T at this position. So we're going to put a T in the consensus, in our uh, consensus genome. We then slide over to a different position of the genome. And here we see that there's a reference T, but all the reads agree that there is a C at this position. So here we would say there's a variant or a mutation in the sample with respect to the reference genome, and we would put this C base in our uh, consensus. Now, occasionally it's not clear what the consensus base should be, and this was a major problem during uh, our coronavirus sequencing projects, in that sometimes the reads won't agree on what the base is. So here we've got a reference T, this read says there's a T, these three reads say there's a C, then there's another read that says there's a T, and so on. And here we represent these ambiguous or mixed positions using something we call IUPAC ambiguity codes. So these are extended character sets for nucleotides that stand for two or more possible bases at a position. So the ambiguity code Y stands for there could be a C there or there could be a T. Now, you know, you might think naively when someone, uh, you know, transmits a virus from one individual to another that all the copies of that genome should be the same. So we shouldn't have these ambiguous positions. We shouldn't see mixed evidence um, based on the idea that you say transmitted a single founding virus to, uh, to, 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 to someone uh, that got infected. So can anyone think of reasons why this could happen in reality, why we might have evidence for mixed bases? Feel free to just unmute or, or write in chat or Slack, you know, some, some ideas on why we might not have a pure single viral lineage in our, say, coronavirus sample. Could just be sequencing you can get a, error? Type of variance. Sequencing error, I heard. What was the second one, sorry? Uh, because it could be the variant of the virus present in the same sample. Yeah, definitely. So th those are definitely two possibilities, sequencing errors. I'm, I'll, I'll talk about each one individually once we come up with a good list uh, of things. So you could have sequencing errors. You could have, uh, you know, mixed infections or variants. So uh, definitely we've seen 
is rare, but cases of co-infections, you could have intra-host diversity where a single founding lineage was transmitted, but then the virus mutated into this population. It's not so, so uh, frequent with coronavirus, which doesn't mutate all that quickly, um, but certainly is, certainly is a possibility. Any other hypotheses? These are all good ones. There's a couple of great ones from Martin in the. I see, oh yeah, just looking at Slack here, mixed infections, definitely. Uh, Post-infection mutation, that's a possibility. What about more, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trying to lead you to one that I'm thinking of without exactly saying it. What about things that can happen in the lab? PCR errors, for sure. PCR errors is a good one. Cross-contamination, good one, Jose. That's, that's the one I was thinking of. Um, and that's the one that I worried the most about during, during Campagen, is cross-contamination between samples. Now, something I didn't talk about is, you know, the genome here is tiny. It's 30,000 nucleotides. And modern sequencers generate huge amounts of data. So it'll be huge overkill to sequence one coronavirus sample on one sequencing run. So typically what we did is multiplexed by adding barcodes to each sample. Uh, and you'd multiplex 100 or even 400, even more samples on individual sequencing runs. Now, the main danger there is that if there was, say, you know, some splash over between wells on your plate, you can get cross-contamination between samples. Uh, so we developed a lot of tools for detecting contamination that give you this pattern of variance where you can have you know, multiple mixed bases. But all the other things, the, 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 all the other ideas that were mentioned, like mixed infections, sequencing errors, um, you know, co-infection, intra-host diversity from, from mutations happening and after infection, those are all valid possibilities. So the fact that we see, you know, ambiguous bases can just, just definitively say whether it's cross-contamination versus, say, co-infections. Uh, you typically need to go back and do some investigation, like looking at other samples that are on the same plate to see whether there's a valid mixture. And we're going to come back to that uh, a little bit later on. I will make a quick mention of sequencing errors, though. The variant callers typically have error models built in. So the sequencers will estimate quality scores, which is uh, a number representing how reliable it thinks the sequenced base is. And the variant callers will use those quality scores to estimate whether the evidence that these positions are uh, caused by sequencing errors or caused by true variation. And this is the type of thing that I work on, you know, in my day job is building these probabilistic models for determining whether something is a sequencing error or whether something is uh, a true variation. So we would hope that these ambiguity codes aren't caused by sequencing errors, but definitely if you have particularly noisy samples or particularly low coverage, you could get ambiguity codes caused by sequencing errors. I think I saw a hand go up there, uh, Stephen. Yeah, I just have kind of a, more of a question from your experience in the field. So I feel like a lot of times when labs are dealing with pathogens and things, like the people who are handling samples probably wouldn't be infected with what they're handling, like for example. But I feel like for SARS-CoV-2, because of the amount of population that's probably asymptomatically or just ha not realizing they were infected yet, um, like lab staff, was there a higher rate of of like negative controls coming back positive and things like that? Like contamination, was it a, a lot harder than I think with other stuff that you've dealt with in the past? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not aware of any, any documented cases where say a lab tech was infected and that contaminated. Um, the main route of contamination is the fact that we're using amplicon based protocols. So, you know, when, when the genome gets amplified, the amplicons go to incredibly high abundance and they can contaminate, like, you know, lab equipment, like your thermocyclers, 
like your sequencing instruments, you know, there's cases where there are lab coats that had apple cons, you know, contaminating them and then it would end up in your sequencing run. So because there's such a high level of amplification, um, that was the main route for, for contamination. The second main route was just like splash over between wells. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, automated, uh, you know, robotics for processing them, uh, for processing, you know, these multiplex plates. And there are definitely cases where you'd see, you know, a drop go from one well to the other and that would cause a contaminated. So I'd say those are the two main routes of contamination. Uh, but I think, you know, technicians being infected, certain, I'm certain that happened, but I can't think of any, you know, in any, any documented cases. Thank you. All right, so let's move on. Um, so something I emphasize in the introduction is that we've got, you know, we're sequencing amplicons here and that requires us to revise our, our analysis pipeline to specifically handle amplicons. So I've spliced in a step into our little toy pipeline here, which is saying trim primers. Uh, and the reason for this is that every one of our PCR products is always going to start with the sequence that we primed uh, off of the genome. And that's always going to be invariant with respect to the reference genome. It's always going to be that oligo that was, you know, bought from IDT or whoever, you know, synthesized the PCR primers, and it's never going to contain variants that are actually present in the sample. And this is an example of Lumina Reed that we're going to use later on uh, in, in the hands-on. Um, and I've highlighted the Arctic V3 primer uh, in red here. So this stretch of the read is useless for variant calling. It's only going to exactly match uh, the reference sequence. So we need to identify the PCR primers in our read and truncate the read to eliminate that red sequence. And this is incredibly important for uh, analyzing amplicon data. And there was a lot of cases, especially early on in the pandemic, where there was data that was improperly trimmed that made it into public databases which looked like, uh, you know, there was a genome that had a reference base in say an inappropriate spot. And early on in the pandemic, you know, groups were trying to make inferences of say, introductions, uh, you know, where the virus was introduced into say a country based on individual SNPs. And there are cases where those SNP calls were incorrect because primers weren't trimmed. So this is something that I really like to emphasize when talking about, talking about amplicon data, as it's an absolutely mandatory step. You need to identify and remove your PCR primers. Um, so here's what it looks like. Uh, so we're going to be looking at IGV later on in the lab. Um, so each one of these gray bars is a read uh, aligned to coronavirus reference genome. This is the BAM file before primer trimming, and this is the BAM file after primer trimming. So it's just identified all of the bases that uh, are from Arctic V3 primers and then just clip them off the read to give this alignment that starts 20 bases over. Um, and again, we'll see examples of this a little bit later on in the lab. Okay, so that's sort of a very high level overview of the analysis pipeline. So I'm gonna come to this section on quality control. And I think this relates back to a question I got at the very beginning is of like, how do we know our results are reliable? Especially when you sequence, you know, cl real clinical samples with very, very limited viral material. So there's typically three things that we care about uh, when we're quality, can check, quality checking our results. Uh, we wanna know whether the virus genome was successfully sequenced. That's a fairly basic one. We want to know whether that genome sequence is accurate. So we want to know that this consensus sequence doesn't contain a lot of sequencing errors or PCR errors. Uh, and we want to do sort of run level quality control to make sure that the sequencing run wasn't contaminated. Again, that's just touching on this idea that the sequencing protocols are highly multiplexed and we're running you know, very, very high number of PCR amplification cycles. So our amplicons can, uh, go to very, very high copy number and, you know, we risk, you know, contaminating them across the plate and then, uh, you know, having problems when we're trying to infer our genome sequences. So let's talk about these one by one. So first we're going to check whether our genome is successfully sequenced. So the way that we do this, and again, we're going to do this hands-on in the lab, is by looking at the coverage of the genome 
uh, position by position. So here we just mapped the reads to our coronavirus reference genome, and we're plotting the read depth, the number of reads covering each position of the genome. So the number of bases in each one of those pile-up columns that I showed you uh, in the slides about consensus sequencing. Um, now this was some cancogen data we typically sequenced here to ICR to around thousand X coverage. And we see that this sample, uh, which had a fairly low QPCR CT value of 16, uh, it had pretty uniform coverage of around thousand X from base zero all the way up to base 30,000. This is the ideal coverage protocol. There's not a lot of coverage variation. It looks like the whole genome was sequenced. So we should have a good, good amount of confidence that uh, we'll be able to infer an accurate consensus sequence from this sample. Here's a sample that had a higher CT value of 25. Uh, CT is just the threshold um, for detection for the qPCR assay. So CT of 25 means that it was called positive after 25 cycles of PCR. Um, that's getting to be fairly high. I'll show higher examples of, of, of CTs in a little bit, but it's still something that we would think we can sequence. Um, but here we see a lot of these downward spikes in our coverage profile where the coverage drops to zero or very, very low coverage like 10X. So these are ample cons that are very, very weak or entirely failed like this example. But really the genome was covered, most of the genome was covered between 100X and 1000X. So we should be able to recover a genome sequence that's mostly complete and fairly accurate. Here's a very high CT sample, CT34. So 34 cycles of PCR before it was detected positive. Um, and we see there's tons of draw. So the genome coverage is very, very spotty. Some amplicons worked very, fairly well, but for the majority of the genome, I'd say we don't have enough coverage to cal calculate a consensus sequence. So we would have you know, a lot of apprehension about using this sample for downstream analysis. Now, it's fine to look at these plots, and I looked at a great deal of these plots during uh, you know, Cancogen, uh, but we need automated ways to assess the complete uh, completeness of our genome. And the way that we uh, do this is that we calculate the proportion of bases that are actual nucleotides, E, C, G, or T, rather than the low coverage positions we get, which get masked as in ambiguous bases in our genome. So in the pipelines that we're going to be using, if there's 10x coverage or higher, there's a consensus base that's called at that position. If there's less than 10x coverage, that position in the genome gets annotated with an N, basically saying there was insufficient information to call a base at that position. So we define genome completeness as the proportion of non-N bases in our sample. So for example, this sample here had three N bases. These are three bases that are low coverage seven ACGT bases. So our genome completeness would be uh, 70%, seven out of 10. This one, there was only one uh, ambiguous base. So our genome completeness would be 90%. And this is crucially tied to this coverage plot here. And the completeness is essentially the amount of positions that are over this 10X line uh, here. Uh, so the reason that we care about this is that incomplete genomes are going to be much harder to analyze. For example, it's going to be harder to place a genome on the phylogenetic tree. Um, incomplete genomes also tend to have more sequencing errors. So this was the main QC check that we use in Cancogen, is that we only analyzed and we only submitted genomes that had completeness greater than 90% to public repositories like you say. Um, so that was the first check that we did, is that if the completeness is over 90%, we would proceed with that sample uh, for downstream analysis. Different projects had different thresholds for completeness, but this 80 to 90% was around the standard that most people use. Um, now I touched on QPCR CT values. Um, here's a look at the amount 
uh, the, the genome completeness as a function of qPCRCT. Um, so I think this was for a large collection of samples that we sequenced at OICR. Uh, and we can see there's this relationship between CT and uh, genome completeness, where for CT less than 30, we we're typically getting nearly complete or complete genomes. For CT greater than 30, uh, there's a lot less viral material, and we see the completeness drops off quite a lot. So we set a threshold that we wouldn't accept for sequencing any samples that are greater than CT30. That decision was obviously made after this plot was made, uh, generated, um, but that just increased the efficiency of our sequencing and uh, avoided wasting money on samples that were unlikely to give a usable result. Um, so this is a heat map of a lot of samples, about 100 samples. Uh, and the coverage for all the different Arctic amplicons, ranging from amplicon 1 up to amplicon 98. Um, and the only thing I want to point out here is that the efficiency of uh, different amplicons varies. Uh, with this light banding pattern here, blue being very high coverage for that amplicon, red being very low coverage for that amplicon, uh, this light banding pattern here indicates that these three amplicons all had lower coverage in pretty much every sample on the sequence data. And these amplicons were very, very well known to be the most problematic uh, for Arctic. And the reason that we needed to sequence so deeply is that these three amplicons and some other amplicons underperformed the rest of them, even after primer uh, balancing. All right, so let's talk about sequencing accuracy. Uh, so now we want to assess where our genome uh, consensus sequences are accurate. Um, and the main way, main, main way that we do that is that we look at the pattern of SNPs present across all samples on an individual, se individual sequencing run. Uh, and we call this our tree SNPs plot because we've built a phylogenetic tree on the left from all of our consensus sequences and ordered the sequences based on their placement in this phylogenetic tree. And then on the right, we've uh, plotted every position of the genome with a colored box if there's a SNP in that position with respect to uh, the reference genome, which is plotted down here at the very bottom. So here we can see a lot of sharing of the variation across the samples on this little demonstration sequencing run. For example, this cluster of samples here, it looks like there's about 10 samples in this cluster, all share a T SNP at this position, T SNP at this one, this one, uh, this one, and this one, with the exception of this sample at the bottom, which didn't have a handful of SNPs uh, at these columns. Uh, we can also look at, say, this cluster here, which is larger, which is defined by this uh, three base substitution near the end of the genome. And even within this cluster, there's some variation uh, where this subset of samples all shares these five SNPs. So this gives you sort of a graphical overview of the genomes that were present in your sequencing run. And we can start to see samples that may have had uh, sequencing problems. These gray boxes are where there's ends in the genome and the black boxes are where there's those ambiguity codes, those IUPAC ambiguity codes um, that look like mixed bases. And we're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Uh, so one of the main QCs that we performed is by counting the number of mixed or ambiguous uh, bases as a function of our QPCRCT value. And just like genome completeness, we see this relationship between CT and the number of ambiguous bases in our uh, genome. Now, we never really nailed down exactly what the cause is, but it's probably due to PCR uh, for very low template material, so very little viral material, where PCR errors would then get amplified up to be a dominant or nearly dominant fraction of the bases and start to appear as uh, mixed bases. And this problem would be more prevalent when you have these higher T CT uh, genomes where there's just a lot less template. Also some theories about RNA editing, um, or RT errors also contributing when you have these low, low template material. Uh, material. 
Uh, so one of our main QC criteria was that we would fail any samples that had five or more ambiguous positions because of this reason that they probably had unreliable amplification. Um, so here we would just count up the number of ambiguous positions in that genome. And if it was greater than five, we would discard that sample. Now, finally, I'm just going to touch on uh, how we can detect contamination. Uh, so typically, not, not really typically, so it was a mandatory requirement of CANCOGEN that every sequencing run had negative controls. So something we do is just assess the amount of coverage across our negative control. So here, we're looking at this coverage plot on one of our negative control. We see very little coverage, which is what we want. Um, here's another negative control where we see you know, these towers of coverage corresponding to different Arctic camp cons. This is definitely not what we want. We could say that this sequencing run was contaminated uh, and we would recommend that it was discarded and reprocessed. Um, or you can try to mask the corresponding regions of the genome with ends, but uh, typically we would recommend that we would uh, discard those runs. Um, finally, we can look at the pattern of mixed bases to try to infer whether there's a mix up between two different samples on our sequencing run. And this is a little bit complicated, um, but essentially what you, you do is look for these ambiguous position, which are just noted by these black boxes, and see whether there's a pair of samples on the run that explains all of the positions being ambiguous in one sample. So for example, here, sample C as ambiguous at this position, this position, this one, this, and this. And that could be explained by mixing data from sample B, which is reference at this position, and sample A, which has a mutation at this position. And all of these positions follow the same pattern where B is reference and A is mutant, or A is reference and B is mutant. And we have automated scripts for detecting these situations where uh, the pattern of uh, ambiguous positions can be explained by some combination of stuff.